Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Gottlieb. I'm with the Feinstein International Center at the School of Nutrition at Tufts University. As a head of a research center that focuses on humanitarian issues, as well as connections to development programs, I'm keenly aware of the relationship between research and standard setting. In my previous positions at USAID overseeing food security development programs and humanitarian response, I was aware of the challenges of and need to connect these two program areas. Creating emergency agricultural standards is an important way to accomplish this. Standards that humanitarians can embrace are an early signal to development program designers of potential linkages. SEEDS has the potential to be part of the bridge between relief and development. We are thrilled to have so many of you join us to discuss SEEDS, Standards for Supporting Agricultural Livelihoods in Emergencies. We had more than 250 people register for the event, which I think highlights that the humanitarian agriculture communities really recognize the need for standards to guide our work on agriculture in emergencies. And even more importantly, that you all wanna be part of making sure that these are the best possible standards we can have. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is scheduled for one hour and 15 minutes and we will end on or before that. We're looking forward to a lively and engaging discussion and I hope that you will participate to share experiences and ask questions. I encourage you to use the chat function to participate and ask questions as they come to mind. For those of you not familiar with WebEx, on the bottom of your screen, you see a series of bubbles. There's a blue one with a chat icon in it. If you click that, it will open a chat box on the right side of your screen. You can send questions at any point, and I'll be there to here to pass them on to the right people. Please send your questions to the host who will compile them to have them ready for the Q&A at the end. We will also do a poll on Mentimeter in a little while. For those of you who can, I encourage you to use a second device or window when the time comes so that you can participate in the poll and simultaneously see the results as they come through in the webinar window. We will walk you through what you need to do when we get there. Just a quick overview of SEEDS. The SEEDS project began in late 2019. It is an approximately two and a half year project to develop standards to support agricultural livelihoods and emergencies. The work of the SEEDS project will result in the SEEDS standards. These standards will enable those responding to humanitarian crises to design, implement, and evaluate agricultural interventions to maintain and strengthen the livelihoods of farming communities, support preparedness and post-emergency recovery, and increase their resilience. The project is committed to following an objective and transparent process to ensure that the standards articulate the best available evidence on agricultural interventions in emergencies. That's why this webinar and your participation now and for the next year and beyond is critical. Our speakers will tell you a lot more about SEEDS in a few minutes, so let me introduce them. Adam Riddell is calling in from Washington, home in Washington, D.C., where he's working with World Vision as their Director of Emergency Funding. He supports World Vision's emergency responses around the world and has spent time living in Uganda, South Sudan, Mozambique, and the Philippines. He's a member of the SEED Steering Group. Isaac Jebesilan is coming to you from India. Currently, he is the Food Security Cluster Coordinator in South Sudan, representing international NGOs and hosted by World Vision. He is with us today representing the SEED's field team. World Vision South Sudan is our first field team member. Racy Henderson is the SEED's coordinator which basically means she runs the show for SEEDS. She's joining us from upstate New York. She is also an entrepreneur, a rural livelihoods consultant, and a farmer. She learned to farm in Peace Corps in Mauritania and worked for MCC, the World Bank, FAO, and Catholic Relief Services in West and Central Africa before joining the SEEDS team. Now, I'm going to turn to Adam to give an overview of SEEDS and talk about why it is so critical for his work and for World Vision. Adam, over to you. Thanks, Greg. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're calling in from around the world. We're so great to, so grateful to have you on this exciting webinar. Uh, I'm gonna outline uh, the SEEDS program for us today. 
As a steering group member, I'm going to try to give you some insights into the areas that we've wrestled with as the leadership team for the program and as well as give an overview of the project. But before we dive in, I wanted to set the stage for why seeds and why we're here and and what this is coming to us from. I studied history in undergrad and I always feel that it's important for us to know where we're coming from to better know where we're going. So let's take a, a very quick look at a little history lesson. And I can start with a history lesson from my own organization, which kind of captures um, the history of our, our aid organization, our aid kind of sector. Uh, World Vision started in 1950s with our individual founder named Bob Pierce, who saw the needs of the world and he was moved to act. So he started raising funds for international programs and assistance. And he mobilized primarily American donors to care for the needs of the poor around the world. And as our organization grew, as funding grew, our work expanded. In the 70s, we launched programs to support Vietnamese refugees. In the 80s, we responded to the devastating famine in Ethiopia. And in the 90s, we saw our organization pivot to combating the spread of AIDS. And in the last few decades, we've seen devastating disasters with the Asia tsunami, the Haiti earthquake, the Nepal earthquake. Of course, the Syrian war and subsequent regional displacement, Yemen also comes to mind. And now we find ourselves sitting at home, fighting an invisible virus called COVID-19. But along the way, my organization and others, we've learned and we've grown and we've, um, we've adapted to all these changes. With more funds, as comes more accountability, more questions asked about how our funds are being used, more emphasis on the impact and far less on the feel good factors of aid that maybe once started our organizations. For better or for worse, our governments now view aid as part of our diplomacy efforts and our foreign policies, even our national security efforts. We've professionalized as a workforce. We've studied at top universities. We use the most recent research methodology, methodologies. We write papers and guidance notes. We have think tanks and, and meetings and meetings to plan meetings. And we partner with top tech companies and private sector leaders. We coach governments and local leaders as subject matter experts. Positively, we're, we're moving as an industry to more market-based approaches and using cash more instead of traditional in-kind methods. We have global events that help reform our sector like the Grand Bargain and World Humanitarian Summit. We even get celebrities to wear our, our t-shirts and do commercials for us and tweet about our amazing organizations. If that isn't progress, I don't know what is. We have better coordination. We're working better together. We're breaking down our silos. We're evolving as an industry. And so we've come a long way, but there is still plenty of more work for us to do. I think about what I've worked on this year, probably similar to what some of you have worked on. Uh, what have we worked on? Uh, drought in Zambia and Southern Africa. There was a volcano eruption in the Philippines, a cyclone through Solomon Islands in the Pacific, Ebola in the DRC, which we thought was wrapped up, but seems to be popping up again. Of course, we have our long-term IDP and refugee displacements all over the globe. We have so many disasters that we're responding to. World Vision works with 19, 19 million beneficiaries a year right now in our emergency programs. We're clearly seeing the worsening of climate change and weather events. We're seeing more frequent and stronger cyclones and hurricanes, longer spells of infrequent rains in Africa, worsening civil wars and conflict, which seem to prolong further and further, all of which are impacting the small stakeholder farmer. I mean, let's think about conflict. We have CAR, Somalia, West Africa, Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, post-ISIS Iraq. We have the aftermath of the Rohingya displacement. Sadly, this year in my own organization, I've seen us have to pause on some of our development programs and resort back to traditional humanitarian responses. I, I don't know if we fully understood how, how bad the impacts of COVID-19 will be, but it seems to be threatening some of our development gains in some countries. So it seems we're taking a step backwards in some of these countries and places and contexts. And so the need for strong humanitarians, strong humanitarian organizations, well-equipped staff, and really good programs on the ground is immense. And this is where SEEDS comes in, and this is why we have standards. 
Um, I, I read this week that I think our industry is $30 billion a year. If that doesn't beg for standardization, I, I don't know what does. Um, let's, I'm going to go off script for my, my moderators. Can we jump to slide six, which highlights our various standards in our industry right now? Thank you, Maya. Um, I want to give a personal kind of anecdote about some of these standards. If you're familiar with them, I'll introduce the basics of them to you. Um, I don't fully specialize on agriculture programs, like many of you who may be on this call. I am a bit of a generalist with a strong ag background from prior field work. But so from time to time, I find myself working on protection programs, and I always go to my child protection advisor in my office whenever I have questions. And he's always yelling at me for talking to him. And he says, have you checked the child protection minimum standards? Did you read it first? He's always pushing me to this document that was created, I think, out of the global protection cluster a few years ago. He said, everything you need to know about how to do a good child protection program is in there. And so we printed a bunch of these, and they're all over our office. Well, back when we, back when we had an office, as many of you are now working from home as well. Um, also, with legs, anytime I see a field office uh, in World Vision talking about doing a livestock intervention, I'm always pushing them to legs, making sure that they've read the guidance, they've taken into consideration those recommendations. Um, there are a lot of great standards and tools that we have access to, and those are two of them. I think also of the, the minimum standards for education. I remember my my education advisor doing kind of a lunch and learn in my office maybe a year or two ago, making sure everyone in our office was aware there are minimum standards for education. And it was a big kind of learning event for us in our office. Um, so you can you can see there's great standards here. Hopefully these different standards will be mainstreamed and commonplace. Some of them might be new to you. Some of them may not fully apply to you if you're a, a very specialized uh, role or individual within your organization. But there are plenty in our industry and in our organizations that don't know about these standards. So we're excited to promote them as well today. Um, so as you can see, we have good standards for protection, for education, for markets, for assessments and livestock. But what's clearly missing is agriculture standards. Um, if you have read sphere standards, you know that these are the holy, the holy grail, the Bible for emergency response, and they capture a lot of great things across all the sectors, but they don't quite go into the depth that we're looking for for humanitarian agriculture interventions. And that's why seeds came in. I also want to highlight that. Let me just pause. Okay, so what I found helpful, I didn't I actually didn't know this before I started Seeds Project. All of these standards have agreed to work together, and they have formed the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. I was not aware that they were all working together, but now they are, and I think it's great. It just shows how further our industry has come to harmonize and work together and break down these silos. Um, we talk about nexuses and humanitarian and development and all these other things, but these are a great, this is a great example of how technicians, technical people who worked on all these standards have agreed, let's all work together. So they form the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. And I just want to highlight that SEEDS will aim to harmonize with SEVERE and some of these other standards in terms of our principles and our humanitarian core standards and our technical approaches. And we'll frequently cross-reference those other standards within SEEDS. So if there's something that's better suited with another standard, we're not going to elaborate on it in SEEDS. We're just going to redirect the reader towards the other standard. Um, another example is we're going to use the SEVERE Interactive Handbook platform to host our global digital public consultation in 2021. So chances are, if you're familiar with some of these standards with SEVERE or LEGS and some of your other work, some of these other standards, what the SEEDS project team is going to produce is going to look very similar. It's just going to be tailored to humanitarian agriculture. Um, another thing I love is we're going to also be learning from all of these other groups who have worked on these standards and their processes. We have, we have 
help from legs from others who have worked on previous standards and they're part of our process and our team and they are going to bring a lot of their lessons learned so my hope is that the first version of seeds is going to be really strong taking into account kind of past learning from these other standards let's move to slide seven i'll keep this moving um, we want to talk about the seed standards will enable the best possible programming for agriculture livelihoods in emergencies, if you've not picked that up yet. Um, it's an inclusive and consultative process to develop evidence-based standards for supporting agriculture livelihoods in emergencies. The seed standard will enable those responding to humanitarian crises to design, implement, and evaluate agriculture interventions to maintain and strengthen the livelihoods of farming communities and also support preparedness and post-emergency recovery and increase their resilience. Um, as mentioned earlier, SEEDS will be a document like these other standards, but we're also exploring an interactive electronic version. I'll just pause, uh, jump to slide eight. This is our steering group who are working on SEEDS behind the curtain. Um, you can see their names and faces and positions and it's a great team. I, we came together last December to kind of lay the out the foundation for seeds. We have Hugo at ICRC, Dina at CRS, Andy at Tufts, Sally at SOS Sahel Sudan, Neil at FAO, myself at World Vision, and Kathy, Kathy who worked at Legs. That's part of the learning I'm talking about. She's bringing a lot of great perspective. Having gone through this process with legs, she's also on our team to help steer us in the right direction. Um, we're going to talk later about how you could also possibly join our steering group. And we have we have some gaps in our coverage and what we're looking for, which Racy will talk about later. Our next slide, we want to talk about. So when we got together as a steering group, we said, well, what do we want seeds to be? What is this thing? Uh, how do we want to work? What's the process we're going to use? So let's look at the foundation we laid for seeds. Um, we came up with three core values. Collaborative, inclusive, forward thinking, and future oriented. And I'll just share a few things about each value. Uh, seeds is designed to benefit people who rely on agriculture for their livelihoods and who are subject to emergencies that threaten those livelihoods. As such, seeds is committed to understanding and including local perspectives while recognizing the wealth of experience in the international humanitarian community. This webinar is another great example of how we're trying to be as collaborative and inclusive as possible, to capture as many voices as possible, to introduce it to as many audiences as possible. I hope over the next year you get really tired of hearing about seeds from so many different ways, because we're really trying to reach out to as many places as possible to get participation in it. This is one great example of how we're doing that. Uh, seeds, one of our core values, our second one is forward thinking. We are going to rely on the best available evidence, not just organizational preferences for these standards. And Seeds expects that these objective standards will help push organizations out of our business as usual approach and make it easier to use sound evidence in the design and implementation of agriculture responses in emergencies. Have you ever looked at your programs or looked at a proposal or gone to the field and asked, why are we doing things this way? Well, that's what SEEDS is also trying to ask. Why are we doing things the way that we are and what's the evidence that supports these interventions? Our third core value is being future oriented. Uh, SEEDS takes a livelihood approach to these standards to ensure that responses to emergencies are implemented in ways that facilitate long-term recovery and growth will promote ways to support systems and services during emergencies that are needed to enable post-disaster recovery. As a steering group, we constantly struggled with this tension of what's an emergency response and where does it end and when does development come in and these, what will cover, what is SEEDS gonna cover? Is that emergency, is it not emergency? Some of you also probably on the call maybe struggle with this or you're constantly being asked to work on both types of programs. Um, we will wrestle with this throughout the whole process. <laughs> Excuse me one minute. The truth is the lines are blurry on this topic. Um, we 
it's it's hard to say when an emergency stops when it doesn't but we do really want to stress the the focus here is on humanitarian agriculture interventions but we want to be future oriented we recognize humanitarian interventions lay the groundwork for early recovery for development for resilience and our standards will wrestle with these topics okay our next slide if you haven't guessed it by now seeds is for anybody who's going to use it but our primary intended audience is for humanitarian responders policy people and decision makers. Uh, we hope it's gonna be useful for a wide range of audiences from your HQ desk officers to your proposal writers and consultants, your country director, a technical advisor, especially local community mobilizers. This tool won't be exclusive to INGOs or to multilaterals or for Africa only agencies. Uh, we're truly working to create a global product that can help anyone involved in in a humanitarian agriculture livelihood intervention. Uh, for me personally, in my organization, I'm really excited to see this come out. Um, I have a number of proposal writers on my team who are generalists, and this will be a great resource for them. My field offices do a bit of development and humanitarian programming. We're also multi-sectoral. So there are a lot of people in my own organization who can benefit from this resource. And I hope it will be the same for you and your organizations. We'll move to the next slide, slide 11, and we're going to have a quick overview of our process and our timelines and where we sit with it all, I'll give you an update. We're in the early stages of developing the seed standards through a nine stage process over two years, as mentioned. Those, those stages are categorized into three main, three main areas. Our first one is launching and promoting seeds to raise awareness. Um, we're mostly through that stage. Our second stage is around creating buy-in and the demand for the seed standards. And our third stage is rolling out, uh, releasing and rolling out the seed standards so that it's adopted across our sector. Um, so we're now in stage two and we're at a critical part of the process where we're now gathering and reviewing evidence. And this is the foundation of seeds because we have to provide evidence-based recommendations and standards. Our next slide um, gives you insight into how we're going to organize seeds. We've broken it into eight key areas. We have seeds and seed systems, integrated pest management, disease control, soil fertility, agriculture infrastructure tools and machinery, agriculture market systems, securing land access, agriculture knowledge, skills, and abilities transfer, and lastly, agriculture production systems. We thought this is the easiest way to categorize it. We looked at a number of different ways to structure the book, and this is how we landed. To give you an insight into the process of evidence reviews and how we're going to create this resource, each category is going to have a, de a dedicated person on our team who will gather and catalog and review the available evidence, which will then go towards the standard creating steps. Uh, we know that evidence you may have in your own organization isn't as neatly categorized as these eight categories. So we're trying to sift through what we have, and it's likely going to span across several topics. If you send a, a final evaluation of a great program that did amazing work, it, it probably isn't organized by these sectors. It's going to look at the broader intervention, what worked well, what didn't work well. And we're going to have to kind of review your evidence that you provide to us and glean best practice from that document to fit it into our categories. <coughs> but we'll sort that out on our end. Um, all right, let's jump to our next slide, slide 13. This is what we're looking for for evidence. Uh, here's a helpful slide that shows the level of detail that we're looking for. I just want to stress a few things. Um, I'll let you read it. I don't I don't necessarily have to read it. Nobody likes reading off of slides. Um, these are some levels of degree of rigor in evidence. And if some of you are truly humanitarians, this might make you uncomfortable because you may not be familiar with a lot of these things. And I can confess, I don't always know many of them. Humanitarians aren't known for our rigorous evidence building, but we're gonna hopefully try to change that, right? Um, I want to stress a few points about evidence and how we're wrestling with it on the seeds. Um, just because you've been distributing seeds for the last 10 years across 
15 countries as part of your emergency response, it doesn't guarantee that it's best practice or evidence-based. Um, we're really looking for proof of effective livelihood impacts. I know impact makes us a little uncomfortable sometimes, um, but we're trying to push ourselves and our community to be mindful um, and evidence-based on these things. Uh, my second point, we're not interested in output level evidence. So I, I know we frequently say, yes, we served a thousand farmers and we distributed a thousand kgs of seed and people planted it, but that's, that's not entirely going to help us create global standards of best practice. Um, and so we really want to focus on outcome impact level evidence. We need evidence that's going to demonstrate change. A third point, evidence can come from anywhere, from any donor, from any private program. It can be any scale, as long as it aligns with this slide as considered strong evidence and it shows impact on livelihoods. Um, this is a USAID-funded program, but I would love to see your results from a DFID or EU grant or someone else if you're humanitarian agriculture is humanitarian agriculture, and we want to see the best of what's out there. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Thanks for your time. As a reminder, uh, throw any questions you have into the chat box and our team will facilitate the Q&A at the end. That's a quick overview of SEEDS, of the team, of what we're trying to do, of the process we're using to do it. And that gets us started in our conversation. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, thanks, Adam, for that uh, overview of the program. You know, just uh, I think what's uh, really exciting here is that, uh, as Adam noted, we are linking this effort with uh, all the other efforts that are going on to provide um, really go good standards of practice to people in the field. Um, it's I know everybody, when you go to the field, you want to do the best work you can, and I think the efforts that SEEDS is undertaking along with LEGS, SPHERE, other groups is, uh, you know, these are really foundational, I think, for um, those who do humanitarian work. So uh, thanks, Adam, for introducing the subject matter for everybody. And I think what I'm going to do is turn to our next speaker, and we're thrilled to have Isaac here. He is one of the first members of our field team. Uh, the field team provides critical, practical knowledge and experience to ensure that the perspectives of the communities affected by emergencies and their governments are included in the development of the standards. And Isaac, tell us about what you and your team at World Vision South Sudan have been up to and what you've been learning. Over to you, Isaac. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, friends, wherever you are in different time zones. I consider it as an opportunity to be the first field team member representative, as Greg mentioned, to help develop standards to support agricultural livelihoods in emergencies. So let me walk you through uh, for the next 10 minutes or so uh, about World Vision's engagement, joining hands with South Sudan Food Security and Livelihood Cluster, our initial efforts to support in the process of developing the key operational standards for agriculture in emergencies. Uh, next slide, please, Maya. Uh, I just wanted to structure my talk today, uh, as you see on the screen, uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, familiarize South Sudan context, not in general, but a little focus on agriculture context. And uh, then I will talk about uh, the rationale uh, to engage in seeds work and also what we have done so far. Most importantly, why it is worth the voluntary effort, because uh, it would help our participants today uh, enhance your understanding about seeds. And uh, of course, I will also touch upon the way forward and few challenges that we attempt. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, uh, in South Sudan, uh, over 11 million people they depend on farming, fishing, or herding to meet their food and income needs. Yet South Sudan faces one of the world's worst humanitarian and food security situations. As you all are aware, uh, agriculture activities are extremely sensitive to climate and weather conditions, uh, which in turn affect national food security. 
as over 90% of production in South Sudan. It depends on rainfall. So uh, also we know that early warning is key uh, to equipping farmers, communities, and policymakers with the knowledge they need to improve production. That's the reason why I just kept that as one of the uh, points in the context that 95% agro-pastoralism and 90% of production depends on rainfall, which is very, very important for seeds to consider those two attributes when we plan our, when we design our standards. Uh, again, uh, South Sudan for the past 15 years or so has value with legs. Legs, you, you heard about it as Adam was talking about, which is livestock emergency guidelines and standards. Uh, I'll be using many acronyms in this presentation, which I will also expand because uh, uh, this is LEX gives uh, guidelines for assist assessment, uh, design, implementation, and evaluation of livestock interventions to assist pastoralists affected by humanitarian crisis. In South Sudan, we have a trend now. People go and do community practices and are engaged in livestock development. Uh, but for agriculture, there is no such equivalent of legs. That's what we also heard a little while ago. We know uh, FAO as a global partner to seeds are going to be instrumental in this process in each country. And we also hope that this will be the case in South Sudan also. Uh, in one of the discussions that I had with uh, a colleague from EU, the European Union, he was talking about rural development program in South Sudan. That's, that's what they have. And they were talking about a framework. It's not like a standard or a guidelines that we are looking for, but it is a framework for their ongoing support for a food security thematic program. The significance is that makes provisions for linking recovery and rehabilitation of beneficiaries to the development of what, uh, uh, development of their livelihoods. This is uh, something that uh, in line with what we are talking about, it's uh, community resilience. So uh, I have given the link there. Uh, when we have the uh, text, uh, maybe you'll be able to have that link. You'll be able to refer to that page also. Uh, as I mentioned before, FAO's role is critical because FAO is strengthening national capacity. I'm talking about South Sudan. So FAO is uh, strengthening uh, national capacity for food security data collection analysis and coordination through support to the IPC, which is integrated the face classification, which I will talk about a little later. Uh, resilience analysis, livestock conflict analysis, crop assessment, and market monitoring, and all of those things, which are very important. And uh, uh, in the recent development I have seen in the desert locust livelihood response, that is the recent, uh, you know, guidelines that we have. This is again uh, adopted and contextualized in South Sudan uh, because this has been developed by Global Food Security Cluster and this has been adopted and contextualized in South Sudan. Uh, it's a joint effort by South Sudan Food Se uh, FAO and uh, Agriculture Technical Working Group, which is uh, chaired by Food Security Cluster. Uh, why we engage? This very important question. And the answer is, uh, the trigger is right here in this room. Uh, uh, with gratitude, I recognize the presence of uh, Adam, who talked a little while ago. And uh, he's being the uh, steering committee member and he's an international director uh, for emergency uh, funding. He invited us. He reached out to World Vision South Sudan and he invited us, explaining the significance of the role of the field team member uh, in the development of standards that will guide humanitarian practice and funding in the future. That was the motivation, but the deepest intention for World Vision is that World Vision can provide critical practical knowledge and experience to ensure that the perspectives of the communities affected by emergencies are captured. World Vision's field experience and uh, our geographical footprint in South Sudan is an enabling factor also. We have signed a, a multi-year emergency food security program with OVDA, which is also funding seats. So we are keen to contribute to this piece of work in the development of standards in emergency agriculture. Also, given our role in South Sudan humanitarian architecture, co-leading the food security cluster, we believe this also places us 
in a unique position to gather information from other partners in the country and also support them in this important work. Eventually, uh, we'll be also be able to facilitate our food security cluster partners towards long-term community resilience in South Sudan. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding what has been done, yes, uh, so far uh, we have put uh, some initial steps into this process. Of course, we are the only, uh, we are only the just uh, beginning to understand ourselves, but we have taken some efforts. Uh, we have presented uh, seats in various humanitarian coordination platforms. Uh, the FSLC is Food Security and Livelihood Cluster. Uh, we have uh, uh, fortnightly meetings where we have all our partners, many donors, uh, Red Cross, and even government representatives, they participate in those meetings and we presented the seats there. Again, in the Agriculture Technical Working Group, we discussed, we presented seats and we discussed at length. Uh, Livestock Technical Working Group, again, uh, where I'm chairing that uh, work technical working group, we discussed this. And also the Food Security uh, uh, SAG, which is a Strategic Advisory Group, which is an important strategic uh, a forum where we have uh, partners from uh, NGOs and national NGOs and international NGOs, uh, donors, again uh, from the government, a uh, very important department that's called uh, um, Relief and Rehabilitation, Office of the Relief and Rehabilitation Coordinator. All of these uh, representatives are there in that uh, uh, SAG and we presented uh, seats there. Also uh, in the ICCG, which is uh, Intercluster Coordination Group, which is very important uh, arrangement, as you know, because they are the one who are uh, representing in the HCT, the humanitarian country team in the country. So we have made a presentation and we have uh, popularized the seats there. And uh, you know, the, the, the buy-in is very, very, very encouraging. There's a overwhelming interest that we see among the partners, even the donors, representatives. And uh, we also shared seats uh, resources with partners, the cluster lead agencies, donors, and the government of South Sudan, Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Food Security. As I mentioned, we have uh, 183 operational partners in uh, food security cluster. And we sent a detailed communication also to about seats, about evidence collection, and also we called for the expression of interest to be the uh, consultant for review of evidences. Uh, most importantly, in the food security cluster, we created online repository where uh, with the resources that include impact assessments from the partners, you know, they we collected, gathered them and we collected them and we just created that repository, which is available for everyone. Mm, uh, it include uh, 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 impact assessments, evaluation reports, best practices, success stories, all of those things. Even if you see that a small corner on the left, there's a table which is talking about the six monthly action plan that we have submitted to SEEDS. Uh, <clears throat> why it is worth the voluntary effort? To us as a food security cluster, SEEDS is in line with and contributes to cluster's core functions. You see the small circle, the colorful circle on the right. It talks about uh, the cluster score functions. I would like to even uh, read it out for you. A service delivery and coordination. Number two, information management. The needs assessment and IPC. You know, IPC is integrated food security phase classification, which is a tool for improving food security analysis and decision making. And uh, then we have a strategy planning and appeals, quality standards and capacity building, accountability to affected population and also advocacy in all of these functions seed standards certainly have a vital place enabling the cluster function meaningful and appropriate secondly the seeds project helps in uh, engaging with various technical working groups as i said as i mentioned also a little while ago about uh, agriculture technical working group and uh, livestock technical working group and also cash and market technical working group now we have made like uh, seeds has become a standing agenda item at the monthly agriculture technical working group in South Sudan uh, to enable us uh, to update our members and mobilize partners. Also, I consider this as a professional capacity building exercise because uh, it really helps 
when we look into these uh, 12 uh, the indicators to the uh, to collect evidences <clears throat> sorry uh, this also was the effort for, I consider it a privilege for World Vision and for security cluster to be part of this global process representing South Sudan, which is the world's worst humanitarian and food security context. Next. Yeah, the way forward, uh, most of these things I have mentioned in the, in the, in the six monthly plan that I have submitted also. It includes the stakeholders interview. We have a semi-structured interview questions, which I have even sent to partners, received many mails, many responses also because of the given COVID context. And uh, it has been shared with the food security partners, donors, and also in the virtual meetings we discuss. And uh, there's a plan to have the round table discussion among the uh, farming community, lead farmers to document experiences. In South Sudan, we have such uh, wide experiences. Uh, we know about the farmer field days, the demonstration fields where the lead farmers, they come out with some experiments. So those are all the things that we will be able to really discuss and collect information, gather information, and even videograph all of those things. And we'll be able to send it. And this is the way forward that we are looking for. And also capturing the lessons learned by the partners from different phases of emergency agricultural response. Uh, be it a prepared a preparation stage or implementation stage, different phases we have and we will be collecting them also. And the propagate seeds among, uh, across South Sudan to popularize and create a demand for seed standards. Uh, this we have already started uh, doing it. And even the food security cluster meeting, we have invited partners, as I said earlier, we have 183 partners, operating partners. We have, in total, we have 400 plus partners in South Sudan in food security and livelihoods. But uh, the operational partners that we have, when I say operational partners, they are part of HRP or South Sudan Humanitarian Fund or uh, different funds, you know, so those partners. So what we have told them is in every cluster meeting, because we have fortnightly cluster meetings and the partners are encouraged and we have started also. And next week also we have the partners, they share their experiences. They just make a presentation. It's good. It could be a presentation or a kind of a small video clip that they have done. So, and they will be talking about their experiences and we will be capturing them. So we have started that process also. And the propagation is also happening. And in our website, we have put all the materials which is shared with the partners. And it is also available for them anytime when they uh, uh, log into the food security cluster website, they will be able to see. There is a separate, as I said before, separate uh, repositories there on seats. And also we continue to engage with uh, FAO. Seeds is an important matter, you know, for the wider humanitarian sector and FAO, not least that they are also co-leading the process globally. So that's how uh, we are planning our future. And uh, challenges and limitations, uh, let me conclude by ta my talking, uh, by telling you some of these challenges and limitations that we face. As I had mentioned uh, before, engaging consultant, it was a big challenge because uh, a dearth of qualified agricultural expertise in South Sudan. We have people, we have expertise, but to the standard of global review, uh, we don't have, that becomes a very big challenge, which even I have shared with uh, Raisi and, uh, yeah. And uh, the second one is the current context of triple menace. In South Sudan, if you see, there's a protracted uh, crisis, and also there are uh, intercommunal violences happening. And now, uh, late uh, uh, last year, mid last year, desert locusts and uh, the second storms also now and we have COVID-19 now the triple menace it's really really a big challenge for us and uh, thematic focus areas plenty of evidences for four or five themes as I said you know in the repository if you see we have many 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 such evidences available uh, for about five thematic areas but not for all the eight topics and especially I can even name it uh, uh, list it also securing land access is one challenge that we have and also soil fertility and agriculture infrastructure uh, tools and machinery these are the three topics uh, for which we find little difficult to get collect uh, uh, the evidences but definitely we have evidences we have evidences in our country but we have not collected so far we will be doing it and we'll be working hard to get all of those evidences as well 
and uh, video documentation and uh, field visits yes as you know the movement restrictions are there uh, even within the country there is a q14 so partners are not able to move around to go to the field uh, due to covid 19 restrictions and uh, time and awareness raising this is also a challenge now as i said it's a challenge it's not a challenge it's a limitation that we have right now but it is sure that we have we can get more uh, uh, partners into the process since there is a big big interest so with this note i stop here and i hand over the mic to greg thank you uh, all for the for patient listening over to greg Good, thank you, Isaac. Thanks very much for uh, for the overview of what you're doing out there. Two things that pop out to me. First of all, your discussion of uh, linking the relief and development and uh, looking at the issues of resilience. These have been topics that many of us have grappled with for many years, but I think what's important for setting this, what we talk about in seeds of setting standards is hopefully it'll, it'll help strengthen those linkages. The second thing that pops out to me really is uh, talking about field teams and the importance of being connected to practitioners because uh, the standards will be developed for practitioners. So I think for us to appropriately develop those, we'll need to hear back from, uh, from those of you who are practitioners. So thanks, Isaac, for that presentation. Now what I'm going to do is ask Racy to tell you about the variety of ways you can get involved and contribute to the development of the seed standards. As Adam talked about, we really do need participation from a broad group of people to help us ensure that these standards are the best that they can be and reflect strongly confirmed field experience. So, uh, Racy, over to you. Racy, are you there? Sorry, I tried to unmute myself. Can you hear me now? Got you, good, loud and good. clear, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be with all of you today. And we've got a, we were hoping for some rain up here in Northern New York for our farmers today, but it's bright and sunny, so that's good for others. I hope that wherever you are, you've got some farmer friendly weather. Uh, so it feels like that's the least we can ask for in this context. I'm going to share some ways really quickly that you can get involved with seeds over the course of the project. As Adam mentioned and Greg has also mentioned, inclusivity and collaboration is really key to ensuring that we've got the most relevant and appropriate standards we can develop. Um, so we were going to do a quick poll, uh, but I think in the interest of time and so that we can get to questions we will send out a link to the poll and you can complete that uh at your leisure uh there you will also when you complete the poll you'll also be able to see the results of everyone else that completed the poll and it's it's a question about uh we're we're asking you to to answer questions about the most common types of agricultural interventions and emergencies and how you think in which areas things can go really wrong and in which areas they can go well when we get interventions correct. So your feedback there is, is helpful for us. Um, it's one of the ways that you can get involved and over the course of the project, we'll be sending out small polls like that to, to gather your input. But as a brief overview for the two years of the project uh, in this first year, 2020, there are three main ways that you can get involved. You can become a field team member. So Isaac spoke to us and we've got uh, two additional, uh, three additional spots available. I'll be talking about that in a minute. Uh, you can nominate steering group members. So we have some seats available still on our steering group that we'd like to fill as soon as possible. And possibly most importantly, you can submit evidence uh, for consideration in the drafting of the seed standards. In 2021, uh, we will be looking for folks to author chapters on uh, chapters that will be included in the, in the SEEDS manual. You can also provide feedback on chapter drafts when we do our global public consultation that Adam mentioned earlier. There will be an open comment period where anyone globally can contribute 
their thoughts to um, the relevance and appropriateness of the standards. At the same time as that uh, public consultation, we'll also be rolling out some simulation events of the first draft. And those will be uh, led by our field team members and they, you can participate if there is one in your region or you know, if we are still in a digital remote world, I'm sure we will be able, you'll be able to participate even if there isn't one happening in your physical region. So let's take a look at the uh, next slide, Maya. So joining a field team. It's a, the field team is a globally representative group of up to seven members. It's loosely modeled off of SPHERE's focal point network, which works to disseminate knowledge and promote the application of SPHERE principles and standards around the world. So as we don't have SEED standards yet, they're not yet developed, we're piloting this idea of having a few focal points early in the process to contribute to the standards. So Isaac gave you some concrete ways that his field, his team is contributing to SEEDs and uh, the process of contribution is really tailored to each of the different teams. Uh, we have three teams currently, two in Africa, uh, South Sudan and Mozambique, and we also have a team in Gaza, in the border area of Gaza, the IC, an RCRC team there. So we, the membership is open to country offices, projects, or individuals engaged in agriculture interventions, and the specific geographic areas that we're still looking for our teams in um, members in Latin America, South Asia, the Middle East, uh, Caribbean, or the Pacific. So if you have uh, thoughts on a team in your organization uh, that may be appropriate uh, and may be interested in volunteering their time with us, uh, please contact me, just shoot me an email and we will walk through the process together. Uh, again, uh, the focus of the geographic areas we're looking for are Latin America, South Asia and the island states as we did just bring on uh, this team in Gaza. You can also get involved by nominating a steering group member. And the profile of uh, the steering group member is important here because we really would like to get a global uh, diversity in our steering group. Um, so we are focusing on folks who are from Latin America, Asia, or the Middle East. Um, we have representation from the Western world and from Africa, so those are, Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East are the areas we're looking for representation from. And folks need to have a sig significant relevant experience at the regional, national, or subnational level. They do not need to have global rele uh, experience relevant to agriculture interventions and emergencies. Um, they also need to have an understanding of humanitarian standards and experience applying them in humanitarian programs, a good understanding of evidence-based approaches uh, good communication skills and the ability to communicate effectively to groups uh, in discussions and in, during events, and especially now in a in a digital, a digitally connected world, um, the capability to connect digitally is important. Uh, at this time, we're also looking for those who are fluent in English. Uh, our main working language is English, so please, if you have nominations, these are for individuals. Um, specific individual nominations, send those uh, my way as well. We can start with a, a name and a, and a brief introduction of their profile, but I will also eventually ask for a CV uh, and we'll have a discussion with the, our current steering group to determine um, whether the profile fits within the diversity that we're looking for on our steering group. <clears throat> Finally, quite possibly the most important way that you can contribute uh, and get involved to, with SEEDS is by contributing evidence. Evidence is the foundation upon which the standards will be developed. We'll collect this evidence in each of the thematic areas that we've talked about today, 
and review how well it addresses the 12 indicators that Adam showed earlier. Where evidence is strong, that is where it covers the most indicators on the list, the standards drafted for that thematic area will have the highest likelihood of enabling the best possible programming. So strong evidence, we hope leads to, we, we assume leads to uh, strong standards that lead to um, the best programming. Where evidence is weak, which as Adam mentioned earlier, also as humanitarians, we are very aware that we may end up with quite a bit of weak evidence because it's just not what has been common in our industry to, to seek rigorous evidence. But where evidence is weak um, and the intervention is very common, uh, SEEDS will seek to fill that information gap through a process of technical plausibility and causal logic. For example, is it plausible that if this activity was actually done, as this organization says it was done, would you expect it to lead to these outcomes? So where we don't have strong evidence, we will engage in a process of discussion um, uh, with experts. We may bring people together to discuss a specific technical issue to determine sort of the technical plausibility of interventions. Um, in either case, when there is strong evidence or weak evidence, your contributions ensure that analysis that you've already done and learning that you have already had can be incorporated into the drafting of the standards, which increases its relevance, appropriateness, and confidence that we'll have in those standards. Uh, the chapter authors will use the evidence reviews that we are in the process of completing right now to inform their narrative and help define their standards. Now, just to be clear, the list, <coughs> excuse me, on the right, um, the eight thematic areas for which we're doing evidence reviews currently may or may not end up being the chapter outline of SEEDS. We may find that there is a more uh, useful or practical way to, to organize those, those themes. But from a technical standpoint, these are the themes that we have understood to be most common in agriculture interventions. Um, and with the chapter authors in the steering group and the results of the evidence reviews, the final chapter outline will be, uh, will be determined. So just very briefly, what kind of evidence should you send me? Um, I wanna give you an example from ICRC because I think it's the most, the most clear. So ICRC's agricultural interventions and emergencies undergo, like many other organizations projects, they undergo post-distribution monitoring how many seeds or tools were distributed to how many people. For each of these agricultural interventions, ICRC seeks to, compete, to complete also a post-harvest monitoring or what they call a PHM. So in some cases, and of course the post-harvest monitoring is done at or just before harvest time. Uh, if necessary, it can be done just after harvest time as well. But in many cases, the PHM is not possible. Either the context is too dangerous to merit sending a team back in to do an assessment, or funding is prioritized for response over assessment. Um, when, so, so the best package of evidence for SEEDS would be a project where we, the ICRC sent me a PDM as well as a, PD, a PHM, because we can see what was distributed, we can see the methodology, and then we can also understand what happened at harvest time. Was there an impact in increased food access? Was there an impact on incomes from the distribution of seeds and tools? Um, so that we can, if there are questions on that, we can discuss it, but ideally we are looking for evidence that th allows, uh, that shows either a return to agricultural production or an increase in access to food or an increase in income from the sale of food. So evaluations that go as far as that livelihood impact are the will be the strongest. As I said earlier, we will send us what evidence you have. Uh, even if we end up with weak evidence, that is also evidence. We, were, we are starting at the beginning of a process of evidence-based standards for, for agriculture. And uh, we look forward to getting uh, your contributions. Again, you can email them to me at the email you see on your screen.
Um, also, I would add one final way that you can get involved at this stage. And if you haven't already, although I imagine many of you have since you're here, is join our e-list and also encourage your colleagues to join our e-list as that will be our main form of co communication with all of our stakeholders. I will stop there. Good. Thank you, Racy, for that. And um, just I think from my part, one thought is for everybody that's listening in, it's just there are a number of ways to get involved with the project that will be really valuable for us, whether you're collecting evidence, whether you want to author anything, or whether you just want to give us feedback. But one thing's for sure, we really hope you'll get on, the e uh, on our email list so that we can stay in touch with you and you can stay in touch with us. So with the remaining time, uh, I'd like to open things up more generally to the audience. Um, we've had a number of people online and, and we've received a lot of questions already. So apologies in advance if we don't get to your question. Uh, we'll start with some questions that we've already received and please uh, make sure you type your questions into the uh, chat box so we can see them as we go along. So uh, let me go back to you, Isaac, for one question. Uh, what do you hope to get out of your involvement in the SEEDS uh, field team? Well, uh, my motivation and involvement in SEEDS uh, uh, comes from the very fact that this is an opportunity to be part of a global process, being the face of SEEDS in South Sudan. Uh, as I told during my talk, uh, Adam's invitation uh, to World Vision, which I was unaware, because uh, the back and forth communication flow was uh, among the senior management and all of those things. And after that, it was told to me that I'll be spearheading this process since I am uh, with the food security cluster, which was a big, big recognition for me. And uh, that's how I cherish this, uh, uh, this, this, this one. And initially, I thought uh, volunteering to seats would take uh, most of my time, but uh, now I realize that it is actually it adds adds value to my job as a cluster coordinator, and this is where I get my motivation and interest to get involved in seats. Over. Okay. Uh, thanks much for that. Um, I've got another question here, Racy, for you which is what if our impact evidence does not fit neatly into one of the eight evidence review things? Can we share evidence that describes multiple interventions? Thanks, Greg. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you do not need to, your evidence does not need to neatly fit into uh, any of those specific thematic areas. Our, we will share it with the relevant reviewers and they will be able to uh, take a look at what, how to tease apart the impact of a seed distribution from a tool distribution or not. They, they, will, they will have the challenge of determining uh, the, that, that, that where the impact came from. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, let me go to another question I've got out there, and I'm not sure who can answer it, but the question is, is SEED's program <clears throat> different from the One Acre Fund program? <clears throat> Excuse me. Can somebody, anybody familiar with the One Acre program? Anybody want to jump in? Okay. Um, uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think what we can do is, go ahead, Racy. Sorry, couldn't unmute myself for a second there. Um, yeah. I'm only vaguely familiar with the One Acre Fund, but I wasn't aware that they had any standards or globally re um, globally applicable standards. So I would be curious to learn more. Okay, well, I think that's one of the things that uh, we can do uh, as well. Um, we, uh, I'm just looking at a couple of things people are asking about sharing of the presentations, and yes, we will be sharing the recording and uh, we can share the slides as well for those of you out there that really want to see those. Um, let me go to uh, a question for Adam. It said, Adam, you mentioned there are several stages to the project and that you are now somewhere in the evidence gathering stages. Can you highlight what comes next and when might we see draft standards? Sure, good question. Um, we, to, uh, 
we have consultants lined up to do the evidence reviews throughout the fall with a variety of end dates of their times, but we're looking to be gathering evidence kind of now, obviously, as we started to ask you to send it, but kind of it's going to take us a little while to sift through what we get. So we're looking at August, September, October, potentially November. And then we're going to start gleaning and, and we'll move into the next steps, the next steps of kind of analyzing all of that evidence and then looking at creating those standards uh, based on what we receive. Uh, we talked about there's going to be some moving parts where we don't fully know the work plan of how long some uh, some things are going to take, but I would hope that we certainly have draft standards in 2021. I can't maybe give a, a very precise target release date, but right. if you're on our e-list and if you're following the project and if you get involved, we'll be sending out those updates throughout the process. Good. Uh, thanks, and uh, Adam. Uh, Racy, anything to add from your side on that? I know you keep uh, track of, uh, you're our guide and, you know, <laughs> you're running the show. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, as Adam said, there's many moving parts. Um, but ideally, around this time next year, uh, hopefully not coinciding with most vacations in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, we will be conducting the public consultation. We hope to have drafts, a draft uh, finished by mid next year, and then um, looking at doing the public consultation starting around this time. Uh, again, yeah, that is a rough estimate. Uh, good. Um, one question we have is, is the project in Nigeria? Uh, I think, um, Racy, maybe I'll turn to you again on that one. And how, sure. how would you answer that? Yeah. Sure. Yes, I would say that seeds is nowhere and everywhere at the same <laughs> time. Um, we uh, sit where we sit right now, the seeds uh, steering group members and the field team members. Um, we do not have a field team member from Nigeria as we have two in Africa already but the seed standards are relevant for Nigeria and the evidence, uh, there is a lot of evidence from Nigeria that we would love to have. So um, we, so, so that's, my, that's my answer. It's relevant to you, but uh, currently, you know, everywhere and nowhere at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to pile onto that, um, I, I mean, we would love to hear from certainly from uh, practitioners uh, in Nigeria. I mean, uh, Nigeria has been dealing with its own humanitarian crisis, and uh, I'm sure that there's quite a number of lessons from out there. So thank you for that question, and we really uh, would love to hear from you and hope you'll jump onto the e-list and be active participants. So um, we've just got a few minutes left, so I wanna thank everyone for the questions and I want to thank Adam, Isaac, and Racy for telling us about seeds and how people can become involved. Um, I want to emphasize, I really encourage you to get in touch with us to share your evidence and your contacts for possible steering group and field team membership. Uh, also, uh, really, we would encourage you to sign up for our email list because many new opportunities will come up as seeds develops. And I cannot stress enough how important your involvement and your input is along the way. We really need to hear from as many of you as possible. Uh, as a follow-up, we'll share the webinar recording with you in the next couple of days, uh, including the slides. Uh, and when you leave the webinar, a very short survey will pop up. Please do us a favor and take one minute to fill it out. We would appreciate that. And this concludes the webinar for today. So I wanna say thank you for to our presenters uh, thank you for those uh, who helped us put this together, and thank you for joining us today. And uh, thanks and goodbye, and we'll see you later. <laughs>